Okay, y'all turn to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to kind of pick up our study. And we haven't been doing Galatians verse by verse, but we've been hitting on the, the main ideas that are presented there because basically, like I said to start, this is the Magna Carta of the faith is what the old timers called it. Um, Galatians chapter 3. Now, um, I, I kind of forget sometimes, and I don't always do it, but I do want to remind y'all that we have people that need prayer. And um, Mr. Al has a procedure coming up this week. I'd certainly appreciate it by praying, praying for him. Um, of course, Chris. Chris has got, you know, dealing with issues with his legs and stuff, and he needs prayer. And I always ask y'all to remember our widows. You know, we got Yanni, and we've got um, uh, also Dawn. Everybody, you know, keep Dawn in your prayers always, and her little girl. And then always include Pam in that. Even though Pam doesn't have a husband that's dead, Pam is without a husband. And by all intents and purposes, she lives as a widow. And she fits the example of a widow in the Bible as good as you, you're going to find. Um, other thing, too, is I always ask y'all to remember Tim and Lee, both of which had prison ministries and are still, you know, hoping to get back in. And um, That's important. Those guys need to hear the gospel bad. Yeah. And uh, Tim tells me all the time that all they ever hear is legalism because that's really what the people in the, in the prison like them to be under is legalism because it helps control them, you know, right. some. So they need it. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord right. in prayer. Hmm? You, you said who? Chris, Don? There's Chris and Mr. Uh, Al. Al. Yeah. Yep. And then there's Dawn. Dawn. Yep. Yeah. And there's Yanni. Yanni. Yeah, her name looks like Janny. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And also her friend Jeanette is battling cancer over in the Netherlands and she, she needs prayer. Okay. And, uh, but then in Pam too. Okay. Know? And I know there's a lot of others, but those are ones that I try and always remember, you know, remind y'all that some people aren't comfortable with having their name called out, but we know. Pray for all saints. Thank you. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning again to learn from you and to be taught of you through your word. Lord, we know that we handle your word feebly. We know that we are just absolutely without any effort of our own or any ability of our own. And yet, Lord, you cause the desire to want to know you. You, by expressing your love to us, cause us to want to love you. We love you because you first loved us. And we come to you through your word and prayer. We ask you to build us up and reveal yourself to us. And we know that all these things come through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the express image of you. He is love in the flesh. And he is righteousness in the flesh. And therefore we look to him to know you. And we thank you for giving us this wonderful gift. And above all things, sending him to redeem us from our sins. In Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You know something too. I probably we always talk about prayer, and we very we very rarely ever say anything about the answer of prayer. And I don't like to to you know as you, when you preach, you try and remove yourself from the message as much as you can. And I know I fail at that a lot of times. But I did ask y'all to pray for my family, you know, a week or two ago. And I just want to tell y'all that the Lord has blessed me like y'all can't y'all can't even imagine. It has been just such peace and such comfort has been brought to me that, um, and in such a way that I never dreamed. You know, I'm not going to go into specifics, but just tell y'all that, that the Lord answers the prayer, and I appreciate all y'all praying for my family, so thank you. Alright, before we get started now, what we're going to deal with today is we're going to pick up, and in Galatians, Paul has done something overall. Remember, he vindicated his apostleship, because these people were turning from the gospel. He vindicated his gospel. He said, if someone preaches another gospel, let that man be accursed. Then he vindicated the fact that salvation is justification without the works of the law. Remember, the, the Galatians were being told they need to be circumcised and keep the law. And Paul said that's not true. And he used all these different points which we've gone over. Remember, he used Peter. And three things about Peter that proved that circumcision and law keeping had nothing to do with it. Then he went down through history and he used Abraham, didn't he? Then he used the very nature of the law. He used the time gap that existed. How could God have saved Abraham 430 years before the law if the law was required? And he gave all these logical arguments, didn't he? And the last thing he basically said was, look, if you try and get to God by keeping the law, you have put yourself under a curse. Because the law says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Most people today, I have found, that believe they're getting to God through their works. And folks, to say I'm being saved by my works or by the law is the same statement. Anybody that thinks they're saving themselves by their good works is trying to attain to some law. Whether they know the law of God or they just got their own code, they're trying to live up to it, aren't they? 
Have you ever met any of them that really know the law? Yeah. Very rarely you'll meet one of them that can really tell you what the law says. And again, they think, well, the Ten Commandments. Well, yeah, the Ten Commandments are absolutely uh, just and perfect, and they show the righteousness of God. But which one of us really knows the, the full detail of what the Ten Commandments are pointing out? Mm -hmm. Folks, those ten, the ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments go way down deep into the heart, and they show me something. Yes. Corruption, don't they? Yes. So, so he's, Paul has proven all of this. Now, <laughs> in writing to these people, the natural, you know, Paul always does this too, and it's natural. Paul will prove a point and then he anticipates the question, doesn't he? You know what someone had heard all his arguments about Abraham and the law would say? Well, what good's the law then? Ain't that what they would say? Why'd God give the law? So today we're going to pick up with this. And I'll just put it this way. Why the law? Y'all know when we talk about the law, it's something... Uh, we live under laws right now in our country, don't we? And why do we have those laws? Y'all know right now we're in the middle of, of a debate whether we should even have law and police and stuff like that. And I saw recently someone's wanting to defund the military. How are you going to defund the You know, we need these things, don't we? Now, why do we need law? Prevents chaos. Because it prevents chaos. Yeah. Folks, we're a world of sinners, and sinners need law, don't we? <laughs> and y'all know along with this that Pam sent me something I thought I would share it with y'all. It was really good, especially right here before an election. And look, I don't want anybody, I don't care what party you're for. Let's just remove parties from it, and let's talk about the office itself, right? Are we about to fill the office of president? Yes. Yeah. Did God ordain the powers that be? Yeah. Folks, God set government over man to help regulate man and rule man, didn't He? Yeah. Well, are we told to pray for those powers? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, Pam sent me this, and I just thought it was wonderful. This is just a way in which, uh, and this is a prayer someone offered. I'm not telling you to go repeat these words. I just want you to see the, the intent behind it without worrying about either party. Father, I desire to vote intelligently in all elections. I pray that y'all will bring to light, or you will bring to light, things I need to know so I may vote in line with your plan, will, and purpose. In, in our voting as Christians, but well, a Christian has a right to vote. I know there have been those that said we shouldn't, but you've got a right to vote. Shouldn't we want to vote first and foremost according to which one of, the, of these is going to most enable God's will to be done, yeah. right? He says, may things not only come to light for the Christian community, but may things be made clear to the unbelieving community as well. Okay, we want to vote so that the gospel can be preached and lost people can be Amen. saved. Shouldn't that be first? Yes. Folks, shouldn't that come before your pocketbook? Yes. Absolutely. He says, I pray that what is right would be so clear that even unbelievers would vote using wisdom and demanding honesty and uprightness from their politicians. What we ever need to do? You know, you find that when the gospel is preached and people believe on the Lord, even the unbelievers are affected by it, aren't they? He says, Dear Father, in the name of Jesus, may the citizens of our nation become so weary of sin and degradation in our nation's leaders that they will begin to seek out godly leaders to represent them on every level of government. Give such leaders favor with the public and the media. Isn't that really what we ought to desire? Yeah, sure. Leaders that enable us to, to worship God. Now, he's got here a quote from Daniel Webster. Everybody knows Daniel Webster, famous old uh, politician. But he said, If we work on marble, it will perish. If on brass, time will efface it. He said, If we rear up temples, they'll crumble into dust. But if we work upon immortal minds and imbue them with principles, with the just fear of God and the love of our fellow men, we engrave on those tablets something that will brighten to all eternity. Now, I really thought that was well put. And I've got a couple more, and one, one's dealing with Supreme Court justices. Now look, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. In the end, what should we want a judge to do? Fair. Be fair. Be fair, be fair in light of what? What is all fairness based on? I don't know if y'all know this, Mr. Bailey was a judge. No. Mr. Bailey, what is the law really based on? It's based on the commands of God. It's based on the commands of God. Oh. If you didn't know that, go check with the law. Now, how far have we gotten from the commands of God? Way, Way off, haven't we? See, we ought to desire to have people in positions that are going to make their decisions based on the Word of God. I knew someone that went for jury duty. By the way, Lexi's been some of them. Yeah. Oh. But I knew someone that went uh, for jury duty, 
And they sat down and the lawyer asked them the first question they asked them. And the person said, well, I mean, I just make my decisions based on the Bible. And they said, okay, we, we did. out she was gone. Yeah. She was done. Yeah. In other words, they wanted no, and neither lawyer on either side wanted anything to do with her. Lexi, there's a hint for you when you get there. <laughs> but, but the point being, shouldn't we desire judges to do that? Yeah. You know, God gave Israel judges. And when those judges judged justly according to God's Word, what did the nation do? It flourished. Yeah. When those judges judged unjustly, the nation collapsed, didn't it? Y'all look at what we've got. That's right. You don't even put your hand on the Bible in our country. No, that's no, offensive. No, I put my hand on it in the past, but not anymore. Really? Yeah. When the uh, Jews were at Mount Sinai, they said, what he says, we will do. That's, right. now, yeah. that's self righteousness. And they thought they were going to be able to do whatever God commanded them to do. They did. And you know, that's what we're going to talk about today is the misapprehension of the law, the purpose of the law. But in, in dealing with Supreme Court justices, I've got another quote from y'all from Woodrow Wilson. Everybody knows Woodrow Wilson. He's 28th president. Look how far we've come. Me and Wayne were talking a minute ago about Donald Trump was talking about God. And we were both happy to hear a president say God. How far have we come? To just hear a president say God, it, it, it hurts us up, doesn't it? Woodrow Wilson said, There are a good many problems before the American people today and before me as president, but I expect to find the solution to those problems just in the proportion that I am faithful in the study of the Word of God. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Now, ain't that what we ought to want for our sure. leaders? And look, anybody that wants these, I'll send them to you. There's another <clears throat> prayer about the president, and there's a quote from George Washington and even his mother, and it's about calm. But what it really comes down to is, as Christians, yeah, we got an election coming. I'm not. I don't care about what side you're on. Look, we ought to all look at the issues and say which one of these is going to best enable the church to do her job. Mm -hmm. And what is the church's job? To preach the gospel. Okay. If you're a Christian, that's how we ought to make our decisions. I don't care if it's the constable, uh, the county supervisor, whoever. That ought to be first, okay? Now, in this business of law, Paul says, well, why then do we have the law? Well, one more time, Chris said, we've got laws today to prevent chaos, don't we? So Paul, expects, he gets this question here. Now, watch how he introduces it. Uh, in ver I tell you what, let's end with verse 18. He says, for if the inheritance... All those things God promised be of the law. It is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, the, the first thing I want everybody to understand is law is absolutely not equal to promise. Is it? Mm -hmm. No. It's just the opposite. All right? How do you get something by promise? Somebody said, I'm going to do this. There it is. Right? Do you earn it? No. Folks, you yeah. don't earn it. It's a gift. You don't earn a gift. So promise is the opposite of law. Law is the opposite of promise. And in the context, he's saying, look, Abraham got saved because of the promise of God, didn't he? Now what's this promise really based on? Hey, y'all go all the way, hold there and go to Genesis 3. The love of God. It is the love of God and the mercy and the grace of God. Folks, I tell y'all all the time, and I, I'm not ashamed to say it, I do not want justice. I don't want oh, justice from God. If I get justice, folks, I go to hell. I have all my life been a despicable sinner, and when I look back on the people that treated me the best, I treated them the worst. I don't want God's justice. I want God's mercy. Now, Adam, I tell you, we'll just take it from the beginning to deal with the promise. Alright, here's our time. <laughs> We'll start back here in the Garden of Eden and we'll bring it clear across to the end. Right? Now, God creates Adam. And there's Adam in the garden with Eve. And God gives Adam one command, doesn't He? One command. It don't focus on the tree or the fruit. It's not about that. It's about obedience or disobedience, mm -hmm. right? Don't eat from that tree. And what did they do? Disobey. And when they ate, what was the, what was the problem? Sin. And what then is, is going to be the... Tell you what, I'll just do it this way. One law. And he broke that one law. And by breaking that one law, what's the outcome? 
death. Yeah. Now, instead of dying that day, God made a substitute die in their place. We covered that last week. But God at that same time said to them in verse 15, in Genesis 3.15 He said, I will put enmity between thee, He's talking to the serpent, to Satan, I'm going to put enmity between thee, the devil, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that's very vague language, isn't it? It really is very vague. I mean, you could say, well, that means lots of things. Now what they understood of that, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What matters is, what did God just profess for the first time? He just made a promise. Didn't He? Mm -hmm. Had they brought themselves in the condition of death, they should have died. And what did God say? I'm going to do something about it. And that's the promise in the Bible. And what's the promise associated with? See. Now, as we come down through the Old Testament, we get more and more information on that seed, don't we? But is it ever direct and, and, and perfect? No. But finally, when the time comes, we find out something. The promised seed is not Israel in the flesh. The promised seed is not even the children of God by spirit. Who is the promised seed? Christ. Christ. Go back over to Galatians 3. In Galatians 3.13, now we just read this last week, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that, or in order that, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, ultimately, what is the core of God's promise? Christ. He said, I'm going to bring a Redeemer into the world. Wasn't that the promise? Now, you and I have the promise of the Spirit today through Christ, but what does the Spirit basically reveal to us? Christ. So then he, he says, look, I'm going to bring the seed into the world. Now, come on down to verse 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Y'all remember God told Abraham, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. He says, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So when he said, I'm going to bring the seed of the woman into the world, what he was saying in Old Testament uh, prophetic language was, I'm going to send a Redeemer. I'm going to send the seed, not of Adam, but the seed of God. I'm going to send the head of a new race. I'm going to create new spiritual children. I'm going to do all these things not because man deserves it or man earned it. I'm going to do it because I promise. Everybody see the difference? Okay, now let's go back over to Galatians 3 and let's read verse 18 again. For if the promise be of the law, it is no, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now if we just follow this down, Who's the person in the Bible that God began to really expound upon? Not the first man saved, but God made a vague promise in the garden, didn't He? He made a, a little more promise to Noah. And we see down through the Old Testament, He's expanding on it little by little. When did He really begin to, to show forth these promises? Abraham. Abraham. So I'll put Abraham here. Now, he says, in Abraham, God began to detail these promises, didn't he? He began to make them known. Was Abraham the recipient of new promises? No. He was the recipient of new revelation about the original promise. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Have you and I been made the recipients of new promises? No. We've been made the recipients of the full revelation of the promise in Christ. So he says now, verse uh, 19... Wherefore then serveth the law? See, Paul says immediately, when you prove that all these things are by promise, and he's proven, I mean, look, in chapter 2 and 3, he really proved justification is by faith. It's a promise of God. It's not of our works, right? So a man would immediately say, well, okay, stop right there. Dude. Why God give the law? Ain't that what everybody would say? So the next point Paul deals with is, well, then why did God give the law? And watch what he says. 
Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now this verse really is a mouthful. I mean, I believe we could probably spend months on it. But what I want to show y'all is, is what he's going to do. He's just going to lay out some things here. Now number one, he's showing that the law is not a, or the law is a contract. The law is not a promise, is it? Now, what's the difference between a contract and a promise? There's two involved. There's two involved in a contract. Party A agrees to do things if Party B does their half, right? Both parties agree, don't they? But what? How does a promise come? One party just does it. Now that's the difference, isn't it? That's the difference between the grace of God and salvation by works. So now, he proves several things about the law. Number one, the law is inferior to the promise because, number one, the law deals with sins, doesn't it? Does the law ever deal with handing out righteousness? No. Never. The law is not made for a righteous man. Y'all turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1. I, I wish y'all online could see this. I'm sitting here looking at a room full of people with Bibles and I've got three men in their late 80s that are doing it all on electronic devices. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of, look at this. I got Mr. Isle, Mr. Bailey, and Sully all over there either on their phone or an iPad or something. We've come a long ways, haven't we? Okay, now he says in, uh, in Paul, Paul speaking to Timothy says, uh, verse 8. Well, i tell you what, let, let's for verse 7. He says, there were some who desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. All right. Were the Jews always going about the Pharisees teaching the law? Right. Yeah. Did they understand what the law actually said? No. Folks, they had been uh, they had been duped, sort of. They were duped by their own ideas that the law was a means of obtaining righteousness. In other words, do these things the best you can, and God will save you. But that's not what the law ever said. So he says then in verse eight. But we know that the law is good. Now, is Paul writing this before the cross or after? Yeah. After. Did he say the law was good? No. Is, yes. good. is good. Did the law still serve a purpose when Paul wrote this? Yes. Yeah. Does the law still serve a purpose yes. today? Yes. Yeah. He says, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Now, if a man, you know, there was a fellow out of, I believe he was out of California, Armstrong. You remember Armstrong? Yes. Armstrong resurrected the law and put millions of people under the law, didn't he? Did he use it lawfully? No. Folks, that's not a lawful use of the law. Many people were deceived by that. And I, I pray God shows them grace. And I, I believe that you know, God will deal with them graciously in, in their intention to do these things. But the point being is, what would make me think that I, as a Gentile, could keep the law when the people that God gave the law couldn't keep it? I, I'm far off from the law. How am I going to do it when the people that were nigh unto God couldn't? So he says, Armstrong uh, made it absolute necessary for you to give the tithe to him. Yeah, he did. He, he did. And he, he saw to it that you did do it. He, Armstrong, the people never would admit it, but Armstrong set himself up as high priest. Yes. That's what he did. And, you know, if that man is, is high priest of his religion, then who's not the high priest of it? Christ. Christ. Folks, it's, it's the same doctrine that Rome basically puts on people. And, and look, I don't mean that everybody in the, in the Roman church is going to hell. Look, you, you let God deal with those things. Folks, I have known many wonderful, sincere Catholic people that were doing the best they could with what they had been taught. But the whole point being is that man that's teaching these things and sending them down, it does he sit as high priest? Yeah. Folks, he claims a power over the Word of God. Well, that's not new. Rome's not the only one doing that. Y'all look around. Look at. I mean, you look at any cult that gets started today. The Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, they're just following what Russell said, aren't they? The Mormons. They're following Joseph Smith and then Brigham Young. They're doing what men say. In Jesus Christ's day, who are they all following? The Pharisees. 
And the Pharisees were teaching them the words of God, but were they giving them the truth of the exposition? That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing Jesus Christ had to do was straighten out their understanding. Remember, He told them, look, y'all have heard that it hath been said. He didn't say the Word of God says. He said, hey, you Pharisees and Jews have heard that what the Word says is thou shalt not kill. He said, but I say what the Word's really saying is you better not have hatred in your heart. We, you know, we could go down a list of them, isn't it? And he, he went through there showing them a correct understanding of the law. And Paul says here that the law is still good if a man uses it lawfully. But look at the next verse. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. If everybody was righteous, would we need any laws? No. no. Everybody would do what was right, wouldn't it? Right. He said the law was not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, profane, murderers of fathers. And he goes right on down the list, doesn't he? Now, what does he mean by this? Folks, the law is inferior to the promise because the law deals with sin, doesn't it? What is the, the core... Uh, what's the object of the law? Sin. Yeah. But what about the promise? Righteousness. Uh, right. Now, right away, doesn't that tell you the promise is superior? Mm -hmm. It is. So the second reason would be this. It was the law was temporary, wasn't it? Yeah. Hey, go back over there to uh, Galatians 3. He says, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth, present tense, the law, it was added... Now, you know what that tells me? The law came after the promise. It was added, right? Yes. Yeah. It was added because of transgressions till. Now, what does till indicate? Until. 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 It's going to stop. Right. So then, you know, y'all remember we were all taught that you, you had the parentheses, remember? Mm -hmm. You had law and all this, and boom, here come the parentheses of grace, and it was totally different than what... Well, there is a parenthesis in the doctrine of God, but boy, we had it completely backwards, didn't we? Is a parenthesis added to a sentence? Yeah. In just the same manner, that's how the law came in. Had God already promised, way back here in the garden, had He been saving people by grace through faith? Yeah. Abel, save, Enoch, Noah, right on down, Abraham. But all of a sudden, we come over here, and look, I'm going to add it in green. I hope y'all can see it on it, but I need another color to make it stand out. Abraham received salvation by grace through faith because of the promise of God concerning his seed, Christ, right? But he says the law was added. Look, I'm going to put it right here like a parenthesis. Added. Moses' law. And he said the law was added until when? Until the seed should come. What seed? And when he promises mm -hmm. Genesis 3 15. And so we find out the seed is Christ. Right. Okay? So we'll just put it there. The law goes until the seed comes. Now, before the cross, did men fully understand this? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. It was vague, it was dark. That's why we live in such a better uh, dispensing of things, don't we? We've got straight, plain language. They lived under a shadow. We live in the clear. But he says again. The law was added uh, because of transgressions till the seed should come. Now, has the seed come? Then does the law continue today in the same position and with the same authority as it once did? No, no. it doesn't. Moses' law doesn't. So he says the, the law is inferior to the promise because, number one, it dealt with sins. The promise deals with righteousness. Number two, the law was temporary. And yet, what is the promise? Eternal. Eternal. Okay, eternal. Number three, it was given indirectly through mediators. Watch again what he says. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And another reason it's inferior, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now what he means here is when God gave the law on Mount Sinai, how did it come? It came through the hands of angels. 
And we don't, we're not told that directly at the time, but we'll look at the scriptures later that explain it. Folks, God Himself shook that mountain, didn't He? In the book of Revelation, one of the things we noticed in our study of Revelation was how does God uh, affect the, the creation? Remember the angel that had power over water? The angel had power over fire? So then, did God shake Mount Sinai? Yeah. Yeah. It says He came down with ten thousands of His saints. Folks, it doesn't mean Old, Old Testament believers. It's talking about His holy ones, the angels. And we're going to read several verses that tell us God gave it in the hands of a mediator. Who's the mediator God gave the law to? Christ. Well, Christ is the mediator ultimately, but He gave it to Moses as a type back there, didn't He? And Trish is right. Moses was just a representation of Christ under the promise. But think about this. When you get a promise, how does a promise come? How did Abraham receive the promises? Folks, God spoke to Abraham. Didn't He? How did Abraham get the promises? He got them from God. Well, why? God's one and He said, this is what I'm going to do. Now, I don't mean that there's not God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What I mean is that God spoke to man and said, this is what I'm going to do. Remember, He told Abraham, I'm going to do these things when Abraham as yet had none of them, didn't He? He said, I'm going to give you a child. Abraham said, well, how can that possibly be? He said, well, I said it's going to be. That's why. I'm God. I can do it. I'm going to give you a child. And Abraham said, well, that's a legitimate argument. He just believed God and said God can do it, didn't He? Y'all yeah. ever feel that way? Yeah. Someone asked me recently if there was any hope for our country. Well, sure there's hope. Yeah. We're still we still alive, still yeah, have God, don't choice. we? Yeah. Hey, folks, I don't know what's going to happen. If we continue down the road we're going, we're headed for civil war. I can see that. But I know one thing, if God gets ready to act and change things, will He? Yes. He will. So then what do we need to do? Either way, don't worry. Put your trust in God. Right. Now next, when God spoke to Abraham... Boom, direct to Abraham, promise, right? But when God gave the law, how did God give the law? God handed it off to angels, didn't He? Yeah. Angels came down, and yet the people couldn't come to Mount Sinai. They couldn't touch it, could they? What would happen if the people went up and got to the mountain? Yeah. They died. Oh, yeah. So what happened instead? God took one from among them and He went up the mountain, didn't He? So then who represented God? Angels. Who represented the people? Moses. And what did God do? He gave him the law right there. They met. Right? Now what's better? I was joking with, a, uh, I was joking with somebody I'm close to and I said, the person said, well, um, I tell you what, would you rather this just happen direct? I'll tell so-and-so to, to do this to you. And as a joke, I said, well, how about you? I'll tell so-and-so to tell you to tell so-and-so to tell so-and-so to tell so-and-so to tell me. Y'all, you know, just having fun with them. But you see what I mean? What's a better form of communication? Yeah. Right. Direct. So then is the law superior to the promise? Yeah. No. no. The law is not superior to the promise. Folks, this is what the Galatians were being told. That, yeah, you've received these promises, but now you've got to go back under the law. It's like saying, hey, why would I eat ground beef when I'm eating ribeye? Anybody got, see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I joked, I, I thought about cooking some chili the other day. I joked, you know, and I thought about, hey, you know what, I need to cook a good bowl of chili. And I thought, I love chili, and I do, but then I thought, wait a minute, how am I going to eat that? I'm going to eat my chili when I've ate Chris's chili. They say, well, I'll whip up a good gumbo, but I ate Trisha's gumbo. <laughs> How am I going to do it? Y'all see what I mean? How are you going to go back to that which is inferior when you have that which is superior? And that's what Paul's trying to teach the Galatians. Now, he goes on again and makes another point. The law was inferior because the law was conditional. Was the law not a conditional contract? Yeah. Mr. Bailey said it a while ago. God presented the law to them through Moses, and then what did they say? We'll do it. Remember Moses read the law to them, and three different times the people said, okay, all that thou hast said we will do. See, the law was inferior because the law depended on man. 
Alright? The promise depends on the infallible Word of God, doesn't it? Amen. God said it, then it's going to happen. But the law depends on, in, or on fallible man. How are you going to get a sinner to live sinless? So this is the points Paul are trying to make, and it's all in this one verse. Okay? Um, tell you what, let's, let's go ahead and start looking at some of the specifics. Alright, number one. If the law did not affect the promise, then what did the law do? Now, how could the law affect the promise? When did the law come? Let me put me a gap here, okay? The law came 430 years after God made the promise to Abraham. Now, that doesn't mean that the promise began with Abraham. Paul is using Abraham as his proof text, didn't he? He could have just as easily used uh, Abel, could he not? He could have said Abel was saved by grace through faith because of the promise of God. And the law, which was, uh, what, 2,430 years later, the, it, it can't, you see what I mean? Everybody that had ever been saved had been saved by the promise of God, had they not? The gift of God by faith. He said if the law came after the salvation of Abraham and all these others, then how can the law be part of the promise? It can't. So then what is it? It was added. It comes in like a parenthesis. But folks, a parenthesis doesn't break up the sentence completely, does it? No. When you read it, you know, many times we read the Bible, and when we're reading it, a parenthesis comes in a verse, and y'all know what it'll do? It'll mess up our thinking. It'll, it'll, it'll mess up our thinking. In other words, it'll come in and we'll, we'll kind of lose sight of what the big picture is, won't we? How do, you, how do you deal with that when you have a parenthesis that's breaking up your, your thought? Skip it. Skip it. Read the sentence without the parentheses. If you and I read the sentence without the parentheses, you know what we'll find out? Yeah. The promise is the sentence. The law is the parentheses. The law is a temporary thing. The law was added. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, if the law did not affect the promise, what did it do? Well, number one, he said it was added. And the word added means it came alongside. Let me show you all another place. Let's put, go to Romans 5. And look, I don't want anyone to, uh, to feel like I'm uh, 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 beating on anyone that believes that they're saved by their works or has taught. Weren't we all taught that? Yeah. Folks, that's our nature that we look from a little kid. You just think if you do good, God will be happy. And if you don't, that's in us, isn't it? It's in us because of our sin nature. But he says here, let's go back and look at the whole problem. In Romans 5.12, Paul says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world. Now who's the one man? Adam. Adam. He said, And death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Does that leave out a single one? Does it leave out my dear old granny? Oh, she died. She was a sinner. And you know, the day came when I was shocked to find that out, but I remember seeing her do something wrong and thinking, Granny did that? Granny said that? Folks, Granny needed a Savior just like everybody else. Mary need a Savior? Pope need a Savior? Preacher need a Savior? Folks, I don't care who it is, they need a Savior, don't they? Now he says next, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now, he's going to prove that the law was in the world, wasn't it? Was God's moral law in the world? Sure. How can you prove that it was in the world before Moses' law? Men died. Sure. Folks, if it weren't for God's law, how could men die? So he goes on and tells us all these things about how the law reigned. And he says, look, nobody could have overpowered. Nobody could come out from under it. But look at verse 20. He says, moreover, the law entered. Everybody see that? There's the starting point in it. Moses' law entered that, or in order that, the offense might abound. So why did the law enter? That the offense might abound. What does it mean to make the offense abound? Uh, realized. Realized? Magnified? Uh, really brought out into the light? Bring it out from the shadows and set it out where we can all look at it in a clear light. So he says, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No matter how much that law convicts me and I see how rotten I am. Look, I've just got done telling y'all that all my life I've, I've rebelled against everyone that ever loved me. 
I've done, I've done horrible things. To, I've just been a sinner all my life. You say, well, you ought to expect to go to hell. But I don't. Because I know something. Where my sin abounded, the grace of God more abounded. The grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ hath not only trumped my sin, it's made it as if it never happened. Now how's that possible? Because of the sacrifice God offered. Folks, how bad is my sin? Horrible. But how great is my sacrifice? Better than my sin? By a greater degree? Is He able to take care of all sin? Yes. Then all my sins are paid for, aren't they? Okay, so He says then that the law in this particular case was added. It's a side promise. And that word added means came alongside. Hey, you know, came alongside is an interesting phrase. And literally in the Greek, that's what it means. It came alongside. Look how I brought this parenthesis alongside. Now, what did Abraham's seed begin thinking of themselves after they had received the promise? They were privileged. We're Abraham's seed. Hey, we'll look at them old Gentiles. Bunch of rotten sinners. Y'all remember they called the Gentiles sinners as if they were not, right? You say, look at them. I mean, come on, and thank goodness we were, we're these special people. So what did God do? He brought the law alongside. For what? A comparison. Right. Folks, that's what the law is. It's a comparison. He, I've told y'all, me and Wayne was somewhere one time, I remember, and um, a lady said she didn't sin. I've been told that many times, if y'all know it. But me and Wayne was at a nursing home, and a lady said, well, I don't sin. And I said, well, man, what is sin, you know? And she said, well, it's sin. I said, well, is it sin basically breaking the law? She said, yeah. So I started reading the law to her. I didn't have to read, but just a few. And she said, stop. Okay, you're right, I sin. You see, that, that lady had been never had been shown a clear definition of what the law said. When I brought the law up for a comparison, what did it show her? I'm not righteous. That's why the law is compared to a mirror, isn't it? You look in a mirror. Look, especially ladies. Ladies look in a mirror and what do they see? Most ladies look in a mirror and see imperfections, don't they? I mean, that's what they go about to fix. Men look in it. I guess we're more arrogant. Hey, we tend to look in it and see other things. I, I've been broken of that habit. <laughs> My poor mother is Alzheimer's is getting so bad that she said tells everybody that I look like a movie star. <laughs> I, I know that's you know, but and I feel sorry for her, but me and my sisters can't help but laugh because every time she says it, the reason we all laugh is we know it ain't true. I it told my friend to her. Well, to her, yeah. But I told my friend in Florida that my mom said I look like a movie star. He said, poor thing, with all her problems, her <laughs> eyes are failing too. <laughs> she thinks she's like Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the reason I bring that up is how do I know I don't look like a movie star? I don't look in the mirror. I look in the mirror. Ain't a movie star I see there. My friend said, well, there it is. It's Louis C.K. <laughs> so, okay, good enough. <laughs> but the whole point is this. I look at what a movie star looks like. There's Brad Pitt. I look in the mirror and say, I ain't Brad Pitt. Right? Y'all remember that movie with uh, uh, that guy played such a good role? Me and Wayne was talking about on the way to Homer one time. Remember the guy played the CIA agent with Tom Hanks? And Tom Hanks was that corrupt old politician where they were getting the Afghan war going. Y'all remember that? And he tells that, that uh, uh, politician, he said, well, you ain't James Bond. And that guy said, and you ain't Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> now, he's supposed to be a lawmaker, right? He, you look at what the, what the real standard is and what's it tell you. I ain't reaching that standard. Oops, I'm not, I mean, I'm not in love with men, but I can sure look at Brad Pitt and see that's a good looking man. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of another one. Sean Connery. Sean Connery, sure. He, you know, younger. He was a good-looking man. Even George when he's Clooney. older, women like him. Huh? George Clooney. George Clooney. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about George Clooney. <laughs> but Rock. But Rock. She likes him. But, but y'all just think on this. You have a standard to compare with, right? right? The law was brought alongside to make a comparison. How do I know what perfect righteousness looks like in the flesh? Well, look at the law. If you want to live a perfect life, live right under that law, never break it once, right? Who's the only one that ever did that? Christ. Jesus Christ. So who then is the express image of God, we're told in Hebrews? Christ. Folks, if God were to live in the flesh, what would He live like? 
And Christ was God in the flesh. Christ was the fulfilling of the righteousness of the law. And so if I want to work my way into heaven, I've got a standard. What's the standard I've got to meet? Christ. How am I going to be as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ? I can't be. It's impossible, isn't it? So then what does that then do? That begins to break me down. He, I mean, I begin to see, oh, wait a minute, it knocks you off your high horse, doesn't it? And when you get knocked off your high horse, you start looking and you start seeing, uh oh, there's another one. Hey, oh, I got a liver spot. Oh, there's another one. Where would these come from? And all the, well, what happens? You begin to fall. And folks, that was what the law was about. And the law still serves that purpose today. Nothing has changed in that. So the law came alongside, uh, like a parenthesis, and it came along to make a comparison. All right, a second reason. The law is inferior to the promise because the law is, is, is given because of transgressions. In other words, its very object was negative, sin. The, the law was all focused on sin, wasn't it? And what's the promise focused on? Christ. Righteousness in Christ. How could that not exceed the law? It absolutely does. All right, number one, the law came in for a couple reasons. And I think you could look at this either way. Let's go back over there and read in Galatians 3 how he says it. Because, I, I, again, I think you could take it either way and still be correct. When he says in verse 19, Galatians 3, 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? Question. It was added because of transgressions. Now, I believe there's two ways we could look at this. Number one, the law was added to check or to restrain transgressions outwardly, wasn't it? I mean, did not God give the law to restrain sin? Yes. Folks, me and you couldn't live today without the law. If you have a place that's lawless, I mean, really, what are you going to do? Hey, look at how you see what happens when uh, they uh, restrain or they take away the funds from the law enforcement and they all start retiring. Look what happens in those cities. I'm not knocking those cities, and I don't care if that's your politics. I'm just going to tell you, we're sinners, and we need law and order, don't we? Yeah. So the law was given in order to restrain. God gave the law in order that His people could live a peaceable life amongst the laws. Now, y'all think about what keeps most people from killing you today? The law, not the love of God. It's the law, isn't it? All right. The proof of that is when you when you take away the the. Uh, the harshness of the penalty. When the penalty starts going away, what happens to the crime? The crime goes up, doesn't it? When the penalty gets harsh, the crime goes down. Hey, and again, it's, it's not about that you're going to do away with sin because of the law. You're just going to restrain sinners. Okay? That's one reason God gave the law. But it, when He says the law was added for transgressions, the main reason that the law was given was to multiply and magnify the law inwardly. Right, the law has an outward effect on society, doesn't it? Yeah. But what is the real reason God gave the law? To do something inwardly. The law goes down deep inside my heart and says, boy, you've got problems. You've got issues. You think you're righteous? Read the law. How about love God with all your heart? I remember the day that commandment came down to me. Hey, I've told you all this before that... Uh, I had someone tell me once, I got under conviction about lying. And I was young, I was raised in a church where you um, you had to do certain things, these certain seven things you had to do to be have a chance to go to heaven. And that's, so then I began to see that, hey, I lie. I'm a liar and i got a problem here. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Now that's what the law says, right? Well, I went to someone to talk to them about it, scared. And the person said, wait a minute, hold on. She said, that doesn't mean you can't tell a lie. She said, there's nothing wrong with a little white lie. That means thou shalt not bear false witness that if you go into a courtroom and put your hand on that Bible and then you lie in court, that's bearing false witness. And that really made me feel better. You see what just happened? Yeah. Yeah. She just she lied. She, lied. She, she lessened the effect of the law. See, that's telling me that the law is to regulate me outwardly. But y'all know I remember when the day came when that did its real job. I saw that the law was not given to show me that I ought not lie in court. The law was not given to show me I ought not lie to other people. The law was given to show me I'm a liar by birth. You don't think you're a liar by birth? A cop's lights turn on behind you. What's the first thing you naturally start doing? 
start thinking of something. You get caught doing something embarrassing. You want to think of something. You want to get out. That's our natural instinct, isn't it? I tell y'all, I learned a long time ago, best thing to tell the cop. Last time me and Lexi got pulled over, I've got speeding tickets all my life because I get mad and say, well, how do you know I was doing it? Last time we got pulled over, it was in a construction zone too, going to Montgomery. Remember Lexi up the bridge? And the cop pulled me over and he said, you know, I said, I'm sorry, I had no idea that the speed limit was, you know, they weren't doing work, but they would set up the thing. I said, I, he said, well, I know it because I'm the one that put the sign up. I said, no, sir, I'm not arguing with you. I know you're right. I'm wrong. I just was not paying attention. In fact, I was talking on the phone and I wasn't paying attention and you're right and I'm wrong. Y'all know what he told me? He gave me a warning and told me, be careful. Yeah. Now you see, that. He, but the whole point of it is, thou shalt not bear false witness does not mean, don't go around telling lies. It means what's in my heart. Just like when that first commandment came home to me. I'll never forget that day. It came home and it said, you should love God with all your heart. Now how much is all? All. All your soul. Say, well, do you love anything else? Well, yeah. How about all your thoughts? All your mind? Or all our thoughts about the glory of God? How about all your strength? All our efforts to serve God? Do we have room in our heart for the love of other things, mostly self? Now that's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem we're never going to overcome fully in this lifetime. But by faith, do I believe the day's coming when I will have an absolute yeah. Yeah. I'll never have love for anything outside of Christ and His people. I'll never have another thought that won't be to His glory. Is, am, I gonna, am I looking forward to that because of something I've ever done? No. I'm looking forward to that because of what God did for me at Calvary. There's my promise. God told Adam back here, you created a problem, I promise I'm going to fix the problem. If man were required to do anything, the problem's fix would be wrong. The fix itself would be weak and contaminated, wouldn't it? Yes. If man were to have to sacrifice anything, could you put anything impure on that altar of God's? then how could one of us crawl up there and offer something? How are we going to offer our own works? Aren't they all tainted? Y'all yeah. know the best, Paul basically said, the best work he ever did in Christ still was tainted with a little bit of self and sin, wasn't it? You know, me and you can do, you could go out and preach and somebody gets saved. That person gets saved and somewhere down deep inside, here it starts creeping up, the devil says, you did a good job. And you look and you say, there's another one feather in my cap. You see how corrupt that is? Mm -hmm. Now that's a fine work, but folks, you didn't save that person. God saved them. Amen. And, and that's the whole point of this thing. The point is, if God had not promised back here to fix the problem, the problem wouldn't be fixed. And so the law came along to show the Jews who had gotten perverted in their thinking, you aren't part of the, the solution, you're the problem. And the law continues today. Folks, if a person thinks that they don't need a Savior, where do you take them? Take them to the law. What does the law demand for breaking the law? It demands perfection. And what does one imperfection demand? Death. Now that's why Christ had to die on the cross, because the law demands our death. Okay? Are there any questions about that? Okay, well, let's take a break. Hey, can I say something? Huh? Hey, the Wednesday night class... It's a great one to send out to folks. I think it's on YouTube and uh, uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's lost, it's so, just really perfect. It was. It's so basic. It's a really good one to send out. It was. Absolutely was. Okay, take a break.